This is The Speaking Show. I'm David Newman, and you're tuned in to the number one podcast for speakers, consultants, and experts who want to speak more profitably. Well, you've got uh, a real special treat coming up. You might not think so because the name of his book is Puke and Rally. That's right, Puke and Rally. And I'm here with the awesome and amazing Dr. Rob Bell. So, Rob, welcome to the show. It's an honor to be on the uh, speaking show, man. I mean, you've had so many outstanding guests. I've listened to probably over 50% of them. And uh, I mean, this is a win for me, man. So I'm ready to go. Thank you. Thank you. It's a brave man who puts the word puke into a book title. And I love the, I mean, I love the whole book, but I love the subtitle of the book, which is, it's not about the setback, it's about the comeback. Talk a little bit about your backstory and sort of your professional adventures that brought you to the work that you're doing today. Yeah, man, absolutely. So, I mean, I work with athletes, coaches, and teams on mental toughness. And I mean, you know how important mindset is. You teach that with what you do and, and do an amazing job. You know, the part about athletics that's interesting is, you know, there's, there's no ambiguity when it comes to that. Like, you make the shot or you don't, right? You make the putt or you don't. You swim this time or you don't. And, and that's the part that, that's always gravitated towards athletics. And being a, you know, a young kid, you know, when I got to school to play baseball, I found this interesting thing. It was also called partying. So when I get to college, I, did, I, mean, I had partying and baseball with no accountability. Like, what could possibly go wrong? And I always tell, like, if I'm, or I'm speaking to groups, depending on the age, I always say this. I say, like, look, nothing good happens after midnight. Right. And so this was obviously after midnight in college and I end up walking and, and for some reason we're partying near this bridge in West Virginia near this bridge is this cliff. I end up walking off an 80 foot cliff. You know, I wasn't pushed. I, I didn't jump. I just has, absolutely had no idea where I was. They had to crane me up out of it, took me to the hospital where my mom's a nurse, right? Oldest of nine Catholic family. This happens on a Friday. I want to come home, kind of rehab. I'm back to school on Monday. No sympathy on me whatsoever, David. And so I go back and, and, and kind of limp into coach's office. And he said, Rob, like, look, someone's looking out for you. I said, I know I appreciate that, coach. But in that same sense, but you're not going to be playing baseball here. And so, boom, hinge moment, right? So these moments that happen in our life is a hinge moment that totally changed the whole trajectory. That's where I ended up having no idea what I'm going to possibly do. I took a psychology class, and then it was tattooed in my heart. This is what I'm going to do with the rest of my life is work with athletes, coaches, and teams. And I was blessed early on. So, you know, our mess becomes our message. That test became a testimony. And since then, it's, it's just been a blessing all the way, man. Wow. 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 So, so many questions coming out of that. Let's talk about the metaphysical version of puking and setbacks and what we can learn from setbacks. And obviously, in your case, that setback led to a whole series of good things happening, which initially looked like a lot of endings and a lot of uh, kind of termination of things that you were hoping would turn out and a total pivot and a total hinge, like you said, a hinge moment that got you on a whole different trajectory. In the moment, I know you teach this and you coach this with your executives and with your teams, how do we have the emotional strength and the emotional intelligence to recognize these moments of setback for what they really are and not to panic and not to spiral out of control? I think it's getting back to confidence. And that's where I think that mindset of belief in ourselves that it's really, it's that no matter what happens, that we're just going to keep moving forward and doing the absolute best we can and not let the things that kind of get it, right? I don't think it's the, it's not the mountain, right? It's the pebble in our shoe. It's going to be the little things. And what happens like when the little things start to bother us? That's the indication because when the little things start to bother us, what it's getting back to is I don't think it's going to work out the way I want it to work out because I need everything to go according to my plan in order for me to be successful. And well, that, that's not mental toughness. That's the opposite. And so that's where I really believe it's getting back to that belief and the fact of puke and rally, man. I mean, look, we've all puked, right? Every one of our listeners has puked. But what does it take to rally and how do we turn that setback and into that comeback? And that's the piece where it's like, it's going to be painful. Nobody wants to puke, but always after we puke, we always feel better, but no one wants to puke, right? But it's just, man, what does it take to rally and to be able to come back? Right, exactly. I know one of the sections of the book, you talk about the distinction between overcoming, right? Overcoming a setback versus a true comeback. What are some distinctions there and what should people kind of 
watch out for so they don't fool themselves into kind of a surface level solution? You know, I'm glad you brought that up because I had a lot of arguments with people. They were like, well, Rob, you know, Tom Brady, like that example, like that was just him overcoming being the very last pick. And I kind of put it like this. I mean, you know, in 1967, this musician who was already good got booed off stage and he was opening for the monkeys. You know, it was Jimi Hendrix. And so, I mean, if you look at that example, did he just overcome that setback? The thing is, is like, this is the part that I think is so important is it's a required ingredient for success. I think we have to be told, although it's painful, we have to be told you're not good enough. You can't do it. That's a bad idea. Because everybody who has been successful is either told that through somebody else, maybe somebody close to them, their coach, their parent, or their circumstance tried to tell them that. And that's the only thing. It was it's a fish or cut bait moment, right? You can't be on the fence during those situations. You're either going to believe that negativity and that negative voice, or you're going to believe in yourself. You can't be in the middle ground there. So the fact of you know, being able to come back, you have to have that level of belief in yourself. And once you have that level of belief and that identity is there, then everything is going to be a comeback. It's not overcoming that stuff. It's being able to come back from all those minor setbacks that are a required ingredient for success. Such a great point. And this takes me back a very, very vivid memory that I have in my own speaking career is one of my very first professional speeches because I was doing 10 years of corporate work as a consultant and trainer and speaker. And then I went out on my own and I had a friend in the audience. And, you know, my very first or close to first professional speech, I say to my friend, Jerry, I say, uh, what'd you think? And he says, you know, words that we generally don't want to hear, do you really want to know? <laughs> and I said, yeah, man. I mean, how, how do you think it went? He said, David, that was just the strung together collection of quotes. You can do much, much better. And I was like, what? He says, look at your slides. Look at your presentation. You know what you say? Oh, here's what Tom Peters thinks. Tom Peters quote. Oh, here's what Brian Tracy thinks. He had a Brian Tracy quote. Oh, here's what Seth Godin thinks. Here's a Seth Godin quote. He says, I didn't come here to figure out what Tom Peters thinks, what Brian Tracy thinks, what Seth Godin thinks. I came here to find out what David Newman thinks, and I didn't get any of that. You were parroting other experts and other people you look up to. And I remember like second by second how that conversation unfolded and how that made me feel. I immediately trashed everything I was doing, which was depending on other people and you know imposter syndrome and all of this. I said, okay. From now on, all we're going to talk about is what David Newman thinks. And it's going to be original. It's going to be contrarian. It's going to have my personality. It's going to, and I'll tell you, it was like you said, when you have that moment, do you skulk off and you go, well, he's an idiot. What does he know? Blah, 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 blah. And you keep going down the path of mediocrity. Or do you get the wake up call and do you rally and do you say, man, you know what? This person who I respect said I can do much better. I'm going to do much better. I'm going to raise the bar on my own performance. And that's why it's a blessing, you know? And then if you got the tenacity, man, tenacity is more important than talent. But I love that story because we all have that stuff, right? You didn't want to go through that, but that's the requisite, man. I mean, imagine if you didn't say that. Imagine we just said, hey, man, it was a good job. You wouldn't have been where you are. Exactly. Hey, good looking. Are you currently getting paid to speak? Would you like to ramp that up? We can help. Book a confidential speaker strategy call with our team at doitmarketing.com slash call, and let's see what we might do together. The call is free, but the results may be priceless. Now, I know you do a lot of work with executives and leaders and people who coach their team. How do you help an executive leader who has great leadership skills, but perhaps not that great coaching skills. And for example, they're not willing or they're uncomfortable having some of these get real conversations with someone on their team. So they let poor performers kind of slide by. They don't call out when they see someone not fulfilling their potential. How do you build that coaching muscle in the executives that you work with? I think number one, it's always then getting back to our own identity. The fact that, look, I'm not going to be perfect. I'm going to make mistakes. And that part's okay. 
but to hold people not to a high standard because we don't feel adequate ourselves does the whole team a disjustice. And knowing, I mean, even as like a parent, right? Like, I don't want to have to discipline my kids. It's not like my favorite thing. And now it makes sense, right? Being a parent, like, this is going to hurt you more than it hurts me. Oh, that makes sense now. But that's the only way if we get, it's, it's just being to hold people to that higher standard. And when we do that, though, I think that's when we hold ourselves that higher standard, because I really believe like a better you makes a better us. And that better us is what makes a better you. And it's always getting back to that honesty, man. We got to be honest with ourselves. And what is it that the nerves that we don't want to touch on other people, because that's going to show the speck in our own eye. That's the piece. It, although it's difficult, it's getting back to our own identity and knowing that we're worthy of that. For sure. Let's talk about, I want to kind of go behind the curtain here a little bit around your speaking and coaching business. You have a deep expertise and a really impressive track record in the area of golf and helping golf champions and helping you know future golf champions really raise their mental game and their physical game and everything else. How did that come about and how did you penetrate that niche so effectively? I'm so glad you asked that. Another hinge moment. I'm newly minted graduate with my doctorate degree, right, from the University of Tennessee. And I helped a golfer qualify for, you know, the AAA, the, not the PJ Tour, but just one step below. And he already had a caddy for that week, but we're there that Sunday before that tournament started. And he met an old friend who needed a caddy. I raised my hand and said, yes, sir, I can do it. But well, let me tell you, he was playing so good that week. And it's always like if whenever you're caddying to on, on tour, you know, it's we shot 67, he shot 76, right? And so we were doing really well. And it's the second day of the tournament. And we come up on the ninth green and he's playing so well. And I think that I'm the man, I'm the best sports psychologist that there is. This caddy is a piece of cake. Tiger Woods is going to be calling me up after he cash this nice check. We got two more days to go just in this tournament. And as we come up on that, on that green, he tosses me the ball. And as I'm, I'm kind of getting caught up in the moment, David, and I, I grab the ball and I'm kind of cleaning the ball and the ball actually drops in the bag. I reach out, I grab the ball and I toss it to him like, here you go, pro. Makes the putt. He's in first place. The leaderboard is right there. As we're walking on to the 10th tee box, David, a feeling of dread overcame me. And I asked him, I said, Gary, I said, that was a Callaway 2 blue circle, right? He wants to know why I'm asking him this. It was a Callaway 4 blue circle. So my haste in thinking that I was the man, I handed him the wrong golf ball. Rules of golf are very specific. You call all penalties on yourself, and you have to start and end each hole with the same ball. At the end of the hole, you can do anything you want. We call the rules official over, bam, two-shot penalty. And this is how bad I felt. I was going to set the bag down, just leave, and go kill myself because it couldn't get any worse than this. That's how strong my mental game was. And he doesn't say anything to me for a couple holes, but then on another tee box, he looks at me and says, Rob, either you don't believe this mental game stuff you teach or, or you can't do it, but it says, I need you. And he said, we're going to get that shot back. And sure enough, we did. We got that shot back. But it was only that other hinge moment and feeling like absolute so small that I was willing to do whatever it took to help golfers succeed at the highest level. And people always ask, well, how'd you finish? Well, we finished second that week by like three shots. So that shot never came back to hurt it. But it was that moment then that started working with him and then just being immersed in that environment. And golf is without a doubt the most difficult sport that there is. I know your, less, your listeners don't need confirmation on that, but it reveals our worst defects of character that happen out there. You can't hustle your way out of it. And just being able to help then golfers and you know, navigate at the very absolute highest level that their own head trash that they deal with. It's just an absolute blessing again, man, to be able to do that and work with the best. And, uh, you know, I, I haven't had a major winner yet, but that part is, is definitely, it's coming. And I uh, hope to be on the show again once, once that happens, man. But it's just, uh, it's always the same thing. It's one shot at a time. This shot, you know, and as you teach so eloquently, you have to have the highest of confidence in this shot with no attachment to the outcome. And when you can do that on the, you know, the PGA Tour and, and the golf majors, then you're giving yourself the best chance for success because there's so much out of your control, but it's being able to control that piece. Yeah, absolutely. Well, the next logical question then is how do you take that amazing success and those amazing results from your golf and your, your sports psychology work? And now we're translating it into the corporate world 
leaders, executives, management level people. How do you kind of put the business hat on after you walk off the golf course and tell me how much is transferable and how much is like not transferable, but you've innovated or put a kind of a a business twist on it? Right. Well, I I say everybody's an athlete. Our office is just different, you know, because what what does it mean to be an athlete, right? Well, we're going to have wins. We're going to have losses. I think we're going to have more losses than we do wins. You know, as an athlete, we got to show up conditioned. It doesn't mean like we got to be able to play a soccer match or anything, but we have to show up. And the other part about being an athlete is we compete. And the thing that we're always competing against is that most difficult opponent, right? That opponent that has a strategic advantage over us, our own mind that wants to keep us safe, that doesn't want to reach out, that doesn't want to connect with other people, that wants us to stay safe. And that's who we're always competing against. So those similarities are exactly the same. The major difference is within sports, it's an instant pot, right? It's bam, you make it or you don't. In the coaching world and executive world, it's a crock pot. I mean, there's, we have more time to work on the parts that we want to work on. And, you know, the part is, it's like, you know, just because an athlete, and I'm fortunate enough to be able to pick and choose who it is I want to work with. I want to work with good people. Just because somebody's a great athlete doesn't make them a great person. And the people that we think are great athletes out there oftentimes aren't great people. And the people that we think aren't great people actually are. Like, we have no idea. But it's that line of what we do is just what we do and who we are becomes more important. And like I always say, man, I'm like good people make great athletes. Great athletes don't make great people. But that's the part too is, man, and there's so many people that have success and I work with people that have success, but where's the significance piece? You know, where's that legacy that they're leaving? Because that's the part that gives us a joy and fulfillment is being able to help other people with their own journey. That's where I think when we get that joy, if people got tons of money and success, man, but it's the legacy that we leave and that significance piece. So that's definitely where it all comes together. For sure. Now, you know, it's funny in sports, there's obviously a physical component, right? There's strength, there's technique, there's all of this conditioning that happens. When we take the physical out of it and we're just playing the mental game, like with the executives and the managers, Do you ever come into any kind of resistance where people have had, let's say, a negative experience with a coach or a coach who was too woo-woo, too theoretical? It's like, Rob, listen, dude, net it out. I got a problem. You got to help me. And they're looking at what you want to be a transformational relationship. Coming into it, they see it as very transactional. Help me do better. Help me crush this presentation. Help me nail this meeting. Help me close this deal. Just fix me, Rob. Just fix me. That might not be the kind of person that you're, is your ideal client, but when they have that kind of outer crust, how do you get through? How do you get through and say, this isn't just a whole bunch of mental gobbledygook. This is the real key to your success. How do you make that switch in them? I think working with you, David, really makes a big difference, man. And I know the listeners, like, I'm not, I'm not plugging you, man, but I mean, you do such a good job because it's the problem behind the problem. Like, that's not your problem. The problem isn't the sale. You know what I mean? Your problem is the, so focused on results and thinking that's what's going to bring you happiness when this isn't about the mountaintop experience, man. It's about the climb. It's about the process and enjoying exactly what you're doing. My favorite people to work with are people that have had coaches before. And those are my favorites. I never thought it before because I thought it was like, oh, it's going to add so much pressure. Dude, how can I live up to it? I'm like, well, no, man. Like, it's a good fit or it's not. And man, it's always the problem behind the problem because what are we always looking for, man? We're looking for peace of mind. We're looking for joy in what we do and to be able to impact other people. That's the common thread. If any of those are missing, and we want the relatedness, right? We want to be able to connect with other people. If that part's missing, any one of those, that's what we're always getting back to. And whether or not they want to look at it or not, that's the part of, you know, well, we pay for this service. You know, this isn't a free service. This is a free service, man. I'll just pat you on the back and say, great job. You know, but that's why it's an investment that people make in that coach. What a great episode. Wowza. Tell you what, if you want to ramp up your revenue as an expert who speaks professionally, you should really check out our free online training at doitmarketing.com slash webinar. Let's also talk, because I want to kind of go down this executive track. So once they let you in, Another thing that you talked about just a moment ago is about competing with yourself. A lot of people compare themselves and they might say, Rob, 
you know, there's this VP over here in the Western division. He has it all figured out. He's got great numbers. I look like a piece of crap next to him. How do we unplug that natural human tendency to compare, 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 and really start playing the game that we want to play? And, you know, there's always going to be a bigger fish. There's always going to be somebody with a bigger boat, a bigger car, a bigger paycheck. How do we get rid of that noise and how do you refocus your clients specifically to stop that trap of comparison all the time? Yeah, we got to keep the picture small. I think simple is powerful and it, it takes a genius to keep it simple. You know, I, I always look at it in terms of like the comparison. We've got to be able to look at that as an advantage because what's one of the ways we get confident? Well, that person can do it. So can I. It's a huge source of confidence. But we look at it and try to discount it and say, no, 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 you know, they just got lucky or discount their success. When instead, be able to look at it and be like, what is it that they do? What skill do they have that I can be able to take and adopt and use that moving forward? And that's where I part, I think, true success. This is how we know true success is. True success is being able to root for everybody. Because if there's a big piece of pie and we can all have that slice, if I just show up thinking that there's one piece, man, I'm just going to get my piece. When we look at that abundance, whenever when we know there's a slice for everybody, Man, I'm cheering that person on because I want to know what what did that person do to have success because I want to look at that skill and be able to adopt that into my own repertoire, my own arsenal. That's how I look at true success, man. So that comparison, thief of joy sort of thing, it's good, but that's how we absolutely get better too. But to be able to take the skills. And I always say, man, we got to, everybody always has something that can teach us. You know, my kids teach me more about myself than I think I teach them, right? They teach me about my patience, my level of tolerance sort of thing. And just to be able to, if we can look at it, and that's the part about having a coach, man, that can point out those blind spots for us, but it's keeping that picture small and keeping it simple. Yeah, no, I love that. Let me also ask you another challenge that I'm sure you run into. It's, I guess, a different flavor of the comparison thing. But when someone looks at another athlete or another executive or another leader and says, man, they are at the top of their game. They are so awesome. They are so amazing. I aspire to be them. I bet they don't have any problems, right? We have this myth that when X happens, I'm going to be happy. When X happens, I'm not going to have any problems. You and I both know that everyone has problems. The most successful people in sports, the most successful people in business, the most successful leaders, they all have problems. Granted, they might be higher level problems, higher order problems, but Talk about how do we, along the path of success, and I love what you said about, hey, it's not about the mountaintop, it's about the climb. How do we stop and enjoy some of the stops along the climb, even if we're not there yet, because really, ideally, we never get there, but how do you focus your folks on celebration and gratitude and acknowledgement of the fantastic journey they've taken so far while they're still very focused on the next goal and the next station along the path? It's just such a great question, man. You know, it takes months to prepare for a climb Mount Everest, right? An actual like 40 days of average of actual climbing. They spend the top at the top of Mount Everest about 10 minutes because they got to come right back down. And when do most deaths happen? On the way down. And so we're trying for that mountaintop experience. And that's what we say. But you know what? I mean, I ask all my athletes this when they've had success, they've had victories. How long did that last? Because I've talked with Olympic gold medalists, David, that have won the gold medal, the best you could ever feel. And on the plane ride back, it's okay, now what? Or what's next? And then we're searching for that part to fulfill us when it's only going to be temporary. And that's why, look, I mean, you know, let's use working out for an instance, right? So working out, we have that goal we want to set. If it's going to lose that 10 pounds or hit that marathon time or whatever it's going to be, but it's the actual working out that has to give us joy. It's actual pain. And that's the part where I look at it. It's like going through that, it's the climb itself. And when you're going to hit these small accomplishments, that's the part where it's daily. It's not about happiness. It's about joy. It's about satisfaction, it's about being pleased. And just knowing that, you know, I mean, it's a gift and it's a gift to be relished and appreciated every single day. Because if we don't have that stuff, that's the message we're going to be sharing with other people that we are our stuff. We are our things. We are our accomplishments. It's got to be our identity on that climb. 
And no matter how small that victory is, that's the piece that we have to celebrate. We're still getting better. We're still striving. You know, that part's awesome, but it's the striving. It's the climbing that has to be its reward in itself. And one of the things like, and now just add on this. I mean, when Brett Favre won the Super Bowl trophy in 1996, very, very emotional player. And we got to admit, winning the Super Bowl trophy is like winning the gold medal. He holds it up and he says, is that it? Like, I, I thought it'd be more. See, what he missed is he realized at that point it was over. The season was over. He didn't want it to end. He missed the practical jokes on coach. He missed the bus rides. He missed the locker room stuff. That's what the real joy is. And it always gets back to then the relationships that we build along the way. And that's the strength, man. That's the part is, you know, appreciating that and celebrate those relationships and the small victories, man, are so huge. Wow. You know, I really have never heard that articulated so well about the journey versus the destination. Because the destination, you're right, it's over. The fun ends at the victory line. And it's like, okay, well, so is that it? But then you don't realize that everything that led up to that, that was the win. That was the awesomeness. Yeah, such a great point. People need to rewind, need to rewind, need to listen to this entire interview again. And that was the payoff line. That was the gold. That was the mic drop moment. You know, the reason why I hate sports media, David, I have to add this in there. Because at the end of every single championship, no matter who wins the Super Bowl, who wins the NBA championship, collegiate championship, they always end it the same way. They always say, boy, do you think they can repeat? See, right away, like the confetti hasn't even fallen yet, and they're already focused on the next season. And that's what, as society, and that's what other people want to do, man. They want us focused on this. It's always getting back to man enjoying that. Wow. And the setbacks are part of that. Setbacks are part of that. And that's where I think you can relish in those setbacks as well, although they're painful, it's the medicine we need. Right. Totally awesome. So two final questions for you. The final, final question, because this was so amazing and so awesome, is how do people get connected and stay connected to more Rob Bell brilliance? But before we even get to that, second to last question is if people were to take one central concept about puke and rally, about the true nature of success, about what you want them to remember, about managing their own performance and joy, what would that one central concept be? It's just a great tee shot here, man. This is awesome. If we can just overcome that one mistake, the reason why New Year's resolutions fail all the time, and I don't set New Year's resolutions at all, but the reason why they fail all the time is because, man, things are going good. I'm at the gym. You know, I'm not eating that cake. I'm, everything's healthy. And then, bam, life happens, right? And once life happens, we miss the gym appointment. And then we throw up our hands. And then all the mistakes we've ever made in the past all come flooding back. You know, that's where all the failure then comes back. And so we throw up our hands and we say, screw it, I blew it. When the reality is if we can just overcome that one mistake that we make, because bad stuff's going to happen, we're going to eat that piece of cake. Just because you eat the piece of cake doesn't mean we have to have the whole damn cake. Just because you miss a workout doesn't mean you're missing the next workout. If you can just overcome that one mistake, that's where we get set on puke and rally. It's just about just keep moving, man. The lapses are going to happen, but we don't turn into a relapse. We just keep moving. That's how we get to be successful, brother. I love it. All right. Well, the book is Puke and Rally. Rob Bell, so fantastic. How do people get connected and stay connected to more Rob Bell brilliance? Where can we send them? Where should they go? Well, thanks, brother. I mean, you know, my website's always drrobbell.com, but you know, on the on the it's pukeandrallybook.com and they can take the puke and rally quiz or the infographic there that they can easily download and and those are always great spots, man. Thanks so much for having me on, brother. I appreciate it. This was so fantastic, Rob. And we have to have you back. We have to have you back sooner rather than later. So let's make a date for that. After a major winner. Well, that wraps up another episode of The Speaking Show. Hey, tell you what, if you like us, rate us and review us on iTunes. Subscribe, tell a friend. Go grab the notes and downloads and extras at thespeakingshow.com. See you next time. 